Matthew chapter 28, and then Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 28, then Matthew chapter 5. And um, we are going to begin today to look at the Sermon on the Mount. You say, why are you going all the way over to Matthew chapter 28 and going to look at those verses in verse 19 and 20? Because they tie into this so wonderfully. Heavenly Father, may the blessing of God be upon your precious ones that you purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and whom you have filled with your spirit in whom you are at work this moment both the will and to do your good pleasure and will continue until that great day that they stand before you in glory. Make their life rich with good works. Make their life rich with the fruits of righteousness, with the fruits of the spirit, with a life that cannot help but declare that God Almighty is my God in Jesus is my Savior. Amen. In Matthew chapter 28, we look at, well, let's pick it up in verse 17. Let's say it, pick it up in verse 16. When the disciples, then the disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. So he appointed his disciples to be at a certain place because he had something to say to them. Jesus always had something to say to his disciples. He has something to say to his disciples then. He has something to say to his disciples today. And what he has to say to us today is no different than what he had to say to his disciples then. A little amen would be helpful. Okay. All righty. And then, and, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. They couldn't keep from worshiping him. When you see him, you can't keep from worshiping him. And you're going to find out as we go through the Sermon on the Mount that the Sermon on the Mount is a picture of how you worship God. It's a picture of how you worship God. That straight and narrow path that we've been talking about is the path of worship. A holy and righteous life by the grace of God as something that's a part of your life, not to get saved, but because you are saved, that's your worship of God. When you come to a church service, which you ought to do, you ought to come as often as you're physically able to come, because the scripture says you should come. But even though you lift up your hands and begin to worship God, that's only a very small little portion of your worship of God. Your worship of God is what you do with your life. It's a result of what you are. When you become a disciple, your whole life becomes a worship of God. That's what is such a distinguishing difference between the true believer and the person that's a non-believer. The true believer wants their whole life to be the worship of God, where the non-believer could really care less if their life worships God or not. Another amen would be good right about there. Okay. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. You'll always have a few of those. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Notice the first reason that Jesus gives, or the, one of the first uh, things he speaks about, I should say it that way, it'd be much better to say it that way, as a result of him receiving all authority in heaven and earth, or is for us to be empowered by his grace to go make disciples. Go make disciples. First thing he said, he didn't, first thing he said was not, Go do all these wonderful, fantastic things. He said, go make disciples. Making disciples is the most important thing that could ever happen. Now, we know we make a disciple by sharing the gospel with them that they might believe the gospel, be justified by faith in Christ Jesus, that they would be accepted and approved by God on the grounds of what Jesus has done. But the moment they, they put their faith in Jesus, not only are they justified, but immediately they enter into a life of sanctification, which is really a life of worshiping God. 
So he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people have problems with this passage of Scripture because the Bible teaches in the book of Acts that some were baptized in the name of the Lord. Some of them were baptized in the name of Jesus. Some were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And here they're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you study church history, you'll find out in church history all the way up until the third century, it was clear by all the writings that every one that was baptized was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So someone argues and says, well, why did they use the name of Jesus? Because here it says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. You're baptizing people through the authority of the name of Jesus. By the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to baptize you today. And we do baptize you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Somebody says, well, why would you do that? Because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the divine trinity, which no one Whoever tries to tell you that they can tell you what that, how to understand that, they are confused, really confused. The greatest scholars that ever walked this earth that would dwarf about anybody you and I know today that are teaching and preaching have taught that you can't help but look at the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament alike, and see that the Spirit of God is, is, is talked about as God God the Father is talked about as God, and the Lord Jesus Christ is talked about as God, and that they are co-equal in every attribute, but they are distinct persons. Nevertheless, there's one God, and the scholars call that the Godhead. There's not three gods. There's one God, the Godhead, made up of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to ask me to explain that. I'll just say, well, I can't. I've studied it, I've looked at it, I've tried everything I could. I've looked at all the arguments on both sides of the coin and all of this, and it remains a mystery. To the greatest scholars, it remains a mystery. So if you think it's no mystery to you, then you're confused. It is a mystery. It's always going to be a mystery. If you can understand everything there is about the person of God, then you don't need to be here today. Just that simple. You don't need to be here today. But God the Father in the scriptures is the one who is represented as forming the plan of redemption. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the one that, that gives his life to bring about the provision of redemption. And the Holy Spirit of God is the one the, 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 the one member of the Godhead that applies that redemption to our lives. So they all three have a work. And so when someone is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is acknowledging God the Father has his part, God the Son has his part, God the Holy Spirit has his part, and we baptize you because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to the Lord Jesus, and it's on the authority of his name that we, we tell you now as a believer in Jesus Christ, it's time for you to be baptized. That's the best way I can give it to everybody. But I just said all those things. I, that's not even what I want to teach about. I want to come down here to verse 20. Remember, it says the disciples, the 11 disciples, they went to Galilee, place appointed to them. Remember? And now he's talking about making disciples. And he says here in verse 20, after he speaks to them about baptism, he, teach, he says, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. That leads us right into the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. Teach them to observe. To observe is not to read. To observe is not just to look at. To observe is to learn this, understand it, and observe to do it. The observing there is not just observing to look at, observing to consider, but observing to do it. Observing to walk in it. To observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Well, some of the things the Lord taught us to observe was love one another even as I have loved you. 
Are you just to observe that, look at that, say, ha ha, this is wonderful, but never do it? No. When he taught us the Our Father, were we just to observe that, read it, or we were, were we to apply it? We were to apply it. When Jesus said, when you pray, the Father knows what you have need of, so don't be repetitious like the heathens, using many words. Are we just supposed to read that, or are we to apply that? Everything Jesus taught was meant to be applied. It wasn't just meant to learn. It wasn't just meant to understand. Remember, the problem at the end of Matthew chapter 7 was uh, the people that entered the wide gate are the people that ignored the narrow gate. They ignored the sayings of Jesus. They heard what he said, but they didn't do anything with it. That's why they, they're down through the narrow gate. The Pharisees represented the wide gate. They ignored the sayings of Jesus, the narrow gate, and never did get on the narrow path. The people on the narrow path ignored what the Pharisees were teaching in contrast to what Jesus was teaching. They ignored that, but they did not ignore Jesus. They observed what he had to say, and they're found worshiping God with their life on the narrow path. Can you say amen? amen. Okay. I don't know how far I'm going to get with all this today, folks. We got a long ways to go. But I want to tell you something. Let's just take our time. Let's not be in a hurry. Uh, I've gone through this, and I thought, I taught this once before. It's like I don't even know what I taught. Huh? It never stuck with me, or I never understood it clearly, or whatever. And that's the way it is when you go through something. And so there was only a handful of us that went through this on a Wednesday night one time. But I just want to say, mention this to you. The Sermon on the Mount is much like the New Testament epistles. Say, how is that, Pastor? Do you understand when you go to those New Testament epistles, that usually the first three chapters of an epistle, take Ephesians for an example, or Colossians. The, the Apostle Paul is laying down doctrine. He's talking about the plan of redemption. He's talking about God choosing us. He's talking about how Jesus did this. Then he begins to talk about the fact that we're in Christ. That's all doctrine. After he gets done with that doctrine, what does he do? Then he says, okay, husbands, love your wives. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. Now what's he doing? He's telling you as a child of light, walk therefore as children of light. Because this is true about you, that it be consistent with the way you live. All your epistles are that way. I mean, you look at the book of Romans, think about that. Eleven chapters of doctrine. And then in chapter 12, he says, Therefore, my dearly beloved brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that we've just, I just got done talking about, that you would no longer conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that you would begin to live a life acceptable and pleasing to God. Not to get saved. You're already saved. You're already saved. but to live a life pleasing. Then he, then he delineates what that life looks like. What that looks, life looks like. You just, just go home today. Read chapter 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians. And that, there's the Apostle Paul explaining what the Christian life is to look like as a result of these first three chapters being true about you. Because these are true about you. Let's be, live consistently. Let's live out these other things. You say, well, uh, Pastor, that just is not very interesting to me. I'm not, it doesn't trip my trigger. Well, I'm sorry, you need to be saved. Well, that's not very nice. Well, it may not be very nice, but maybe you have to wake up a little bit. Because this is all true about you, and this is important. This has all been given by God. All of this has been given by God, and it's important. You can't put what's true about you in justification to be important and what's true about you in sanctification not to be important. God did something wonderful in your life because he was seeking those that would worship him in spirit and truth and then he tells you how he brought that about and then he shows you how you're going to worship him in spirit and truth, how you're going to live this out. Can you see that? It's just really, really simple. I discovered something by teaching on Wednesday nights here, the last few Wednesday nights, when we really did a lot of teaching, repetitive teaching on justification and sanctification. Remember that? And I'll tell you this, that if you're not real clear 
on justification and sanctification, you're not going to understand your epistles. You're not going to understand the Sermon on the Mount. You're not going to understand it. Because justification is what sets you right with God only because of what Jesus has done. He accepts you and approves you and approves of you by imputing Christ's righteousness to you because of Jesus dying on the cross and giving his life for you. And the moment he does that, his spirit comes into you and begins to work in your life, sanctification. And what's, so God made, justified you, put you in a position to be a, a worshiper of God in spirit and truth. And now in sanctification, he's going to help you to walk that out. The people that at the wide gate, nothing happens to them. They're just a mechanical mess of religion. They go out the door of mechanical religion on Sunday morning and they live like they've always lived. There's no worship of God. But in the narrow gate, something beautiful happens to us. We're saved in Jesus Christ. We learn what Jesus wants of us and we go on the narrow path of worshiping God. I'm trying to make things that may seem complicated just simple. That's what I'm trying to do. The scripture says in Philippians 1, 11, that we're to bear the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus. And in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 4, says we're married to him whom God has raised from the dead, even the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might bear fruit to God. In other words, there's a purpose beyond just coming out from underneath the condemnation of the law. There's a purpose beyond God just turning away the wrath of God. There's a purpose beyond that. And that purpose is that we would bear the fruits of righteousness by Christ Jesus, that we that are married to Christ would bear fruits unto God, and that would be our worship of God. That would, you, that would be you and I being the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the city set on a hill. Amen. Praise You've all heard that story that I told you about that young man walking along. Somebody said, there goes a Christian, Steve. I says, a Christian? Never heard that before. I was a little Catholic boy. Christian. Oh, Christian. He didn't say Catholic. I knew there was a distinction right away. I started watching that guy. He lived a real nice life, a good life. He was just a, a kind person. You know, I looked at him from afar, but I knew there was supposed to be a distinction. As a young person, I realized that. Think about that. People are not to know that you are a Christian by the church you attend or by the Bible that you hold, but by the life that you live. People know that you're a worshiper of God by the life that you live. You know, I've been in services. I've seen people raise their hands. I've even heard people speak in other tongues. But their life never worshipped God. Their life never worshipped God. Well, maybe they were just a baby Christian. Perhaps they were. Maybe they just didn't know any better. Well, perhaps that's all true. But I know one of them that was having a, a, a sexual relations with his stepdaughter. That believed that. Raising their hand, praying in tongues, and giving money to get something back. Think about that. And came and told me after he heard me preach that if he had ever heard this, he would have never gotten in trouble. In other words, he never even heard that. So could maybe, maybe, I don't know. God knows, right? Only God knows. But do you think anybody could look at that person's life and, and because of the Bible they held and the money they talked about giving and the church that they attended, that they're a Christian? No. Jesus said your life is to be a light. It's to be something that is out there. People see it. Right, City set on a hill. Whoa. Obvious. Obvious. Now, mechanical religion is, is not obvious. Judaism just blends in. Everybody. Catholic blends in. You can come to a church like this, just blend in with the world. Because you've taken, at least in your mind, this teaching of justification and salvation to heart. Boy, when you hear about sanctification, Christian responsibility, living a life pleasing to God, to you it kind of feels like works. Huh. Law, legalism. Not law or legalism. If you see it that way, you're viewing it totally, completely wrong. 
It is one of the most marvelous things that God ever leads you into. It's a life of worshiping God the way Jesus did. Jesus worshiped God every moment of his life. He was on what is called the narrow path constantly. And he said, follow me. What's that say? Well, you're going to be on this path with me. And on this path, something's going to get in the way. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. Because without denying yourself and taking up your cross, you're not going to be able to follow me. Because I'm going to lead you to live differently than the disciples of the Pharisees. You're going to live differently than the religious mechanical people. In fact, when we go into the Sermon on the Mount and we get over there to what Jesus taught about the spiritual intent of the law regarding adultery and murder, you know, you're going to be able to find uh, uh, the epistles talking about the same thing. This is what's been startling to me. I've been startled, startled by the fact that what Jesus teaches on the Sermon on the Mount is really taught in different ways throughout the epistles. In fact, you could, as a broad summary... Not a detail, but a broad summary. You could say that the Sermon on the Mount is really walking in love with one another. He that loves his neighbor fulfills the law. The law isn't fulfilled in the context that the Pharisees fulfilled it because they never really fulfilled it. It's, it's in the context of you following the Lord Jesus Christ, experiencing God at work within you, both to will and to do His good pleasure, with grace and top of grace and top of grace, where sin once abounded in certain areas of your life, now grace is going to be much more abounding. You're no longer under the law, therefore you're no longer under sin. You're no longer under condemnation. No longer, not under any of that, any longer. You're under grace. You're called a slave of righteousness. That's what the Bible calls you, a slave of righteousness. A slave of righteousness. And the Bible says over here in Romans chapter uh, 6, let me look at this real quick. This just pops up in my mind. Romans chapter 6, I think it's right near the end. It is. Here it says, but in verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become a slave of God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end of everlasting life. In other words, to be a slave of righteousness is to be a slave of God. And what does that, what does that turn out to be? It turns out to fruits to holiness. And the end of that is everlasting life, referring to your glorification in the presence of God. And all, it's all going that direction. There's a lot of superfi superficial going-ons among a lot of people. Superficiality. You ever hear that word? Superficial. That person is just superficial. You know, you can have a superficial attitude towards the Word of God. The reason I bring this up is because the Pharisees were very superficial. They were not at all what they tried to appear to be, were they? Very superficial. And when you're superficial, you have a man-centered attitude towards the Word of God. And your attitude towards the Word of God will ultimately determine how the Word of God impacts your life and will ultimately determine how you interpret the Scriptures. Remember, I talked to you last week how the Pharisees, Jesus would go to a Scripture that you have heard is said by them of old. He wasn't quoting Old Testament Scriptures. He was quoting the old sages of the past that the Pharisees would listen to and, and then come up with a, even a more embellished teaching, okay? And uh, it was all superficial. But here, the Lord Jesus says, but I say unto you. Now, you have to remember that grace and truth comes by the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything he has to say to you, he says to you on the basis of grace coming from God to enable you to, to walk in the light of what he gives you. That's what he's going to do. 
He's talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And then when you come to Matthew chapter 5, it says, Seeing the multitudes, verse 1, he went up to the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. That can be argued. Were all those disciples saved? Well, I don't know. You don't know. I think it's an easy conclusion to come to that some were at least curious. But for what we know, what the Lord Jesus said to at least a few of them, they had to have been saved. Nevertheless, these were individuals that in their heart and their mind, they, were, they have decided, I'm going to follow this one. And Jesus opened up his mouth and he taught them saying, and then what he does, he lists the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the, the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness. All of these things are absolute truths regarding someone that the Spirit of God has regenerated and brought to faith in Christ. Whether it was true about all these disciples, there's no way for you and I to know. I doubt if it would be so. Because the Lord constantly talked about the sheep and the goats. He had disciples coming to him and they left him and he said to his own, do you want to leave me too? But that doesn't matter. The scripture here is saying he spoke to his disciples. So irregardless of the condition of disciples, this is something he taught to his disciples. This is something that Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 through 20, especially 19 and 20 there, says, I command you to go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe all these things that I have commanded you. This will be one of them. The Beatitudes speak about the essential nature and character of a disciple. And you'll be able to tell the essential nature and character of a disciple, especially if that person is a true disciple, if these characteristics are resident in their life. But this is actually, lay, he's actually laying down the foundation here from which he's going to call them to walk in the light of the truths that he's going to teach. And those that are saved, those that are Christians, those that, are, that have been regenerated, those that are drinking of the grace of God, will be enabled by God to walk in the truths that Jesus teaches. They'll only be the only ones that will have a heart for it. They'll be the only ones that will recognize that they're poor in spirit. They're the only ones that will mourn over their sins. They're the only ones that will be meek. And so when someone insults them, they won't, be the, they won't be first in line to retaliate. They're the ones that are going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, they're going to want their life to conform to that which is pleasing to God. They're going to be the merciful. They're going to be those that have, a, have received mercy. And now they're going to be those that are going to want to show mercy. And they're the ones at the great judgment seat of Christ one day will obtain mercy because there'll be those that don't receive the wrath of God, but they receive even more mercy from God. And when you look at pure of heart, this is only true of a Christian. And we'll look into that a lot. There's a lot to say about that, but it means to have a single mind, a single eye. You're singly minded totally devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's only true of a disciple. So these are things that he's saying to disciples. If you're a disciple today, these are the things he's saying to you. He's telling them that this all leads to you becoming a peacemaker, that you're going to have a heart to see other people reconciled to God. You're going to have a heart to see other people reconciled to each other. And because you're in this position, you're going to be an individual that you're going to be persecuted. You're not going to be understood. 
And people are going to persecute you and say all men are evil about you. And this is so different than the superficiality of the Pharisees. The Pharisees never carried any of these th characteristics. None of these things were essentially true about any of the Pharisees. None whatsoever. And to the one Pharisee that came by night, Nicodemus, Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Otherwise, you cannot see or enter into the kingdom of God. But here he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. These are those that have been or represent those that are born again. Now, you could come to the scriptures and argue that these people were his actual disciples or not, but that's your argument. That's not mine. The only argument I make is that he's talking to disciples, and this is to meant to be true of their disciples. And it'll become a dividing line real quick between who's really true and who's really not true. That's what's going to be, that's what's going to be found out. The true disciple is going to be one that's going to listen to the narrow gate and observe what the narrow gate has to say, and by the grace of God, step in line with it, denying themselves and taking up the cross. The others are going to hear what he has to say and not do anything with it. They're going to be like the disciples say, oh, this is a hard saying, and they're going to depart from him. You need to realize that the word of God is that way. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides asunder the soul and spirit, the joints of marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus said, I'll sanctify you through thy truth, my, uh, for th through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so he uses the truth that ultimately will bring out the true picture of who's who. But nevertheless, this is to be the who's who of the Christian. This is supposed to be applied to those that profess to, be Jesus, uh, to belong to Jesus. We found some at the end of Matthew chapter 7 proclaiming, Lord, Lord, but not doing the will of the Father. They had no heart or mind for this. They never practiced this because they were never regenerated. Can you see that? It's just like somebody going to the epistles. Someone can go to the epistles and say, oh, this is just wonderful. This is just beautiful. We, everybody should live this way. And then they attempt to live that way, but it's all superficial. It's like people say, if the whole world believed the Sermon on the Mount, we'd have a different world. We wouldn't have any wars. We would have anything like this. No one would retaliate against anybody. But yeah, that would be great. But that has to be true about them. All the, these beatitudes have to be true about them. to have a heart to walk in the light of anything that Jesus is saying. They have a desire to live this way, a desire to seek God for the grace of God to live this way. Knowing all along that everything that Jesus is saying here is way beyond yourself. Just like you coming to faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, no one can come unto me unless the Father draws them. You know what? That, there's an application there that no one can really follow me unless the Father draws them. You have to come to him for justification, but you need to come to him constantly for sanctification. He said, I'll sanctify you. He sanctifies us as we walk with him on that straight and narrow path. It brings that truth into our hearts, into our lives. Christianity is all of grace. Do you ever see the name on the sign? It says Grace Christian Church. It's all because of the grace of God that we're Christians. It's all because of the grace of God we're a church. It's all because of the grace of God that we have been justified. It's all because of the grace of God that we're being sanctified. It's all because of the grace of God that we're studying the scriptures today. And there is some illumination coming from the scriptures to help us. And to hear God's call saying, come, let's go this way together. That's what the Lord is saying. It's a great contrast to superficiality. And if you have a man-centered attitude towards the, the, the scriptures, you're going to have a man-centered attitude about how to live the Christian life. But if you have a Jesus-centered attitude towards the scriptures, you're going to have a Jesus-centered attitude towards living the Christian life, and it's going to put you on that narrow path. Yeah. Now, Randy knows this probably better than anybody here because he's heard me all my life teach on it, but Matthew chapter 22 talks about the Pharisees coming to Jesus with a problem about somebody being married seven times to different brothers because everybody's dying. Remember that story? 
And that story begins in verse 23, and it says, Moses, the Pharisees spoke, speak up and say, Moses says, and then they give this discourse. And when they give the discourse, at the end of the discourse, Jesus says, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And I suggest to you today that that phrase, when they said to Jesus, Moses said, that it lends credence to what I'm trying to argue with you here today by, and suggest to you today that they seen Moses saying something but never heard God saying anything. And that's true about all of us as Christians. You know, there was a time that all we ever heard when we heard the Bible, we identified that with the Catholic Church, with the priest, or with the preacher, or whoever it may have been. But we never really identified that as God saying something to us. But it's amazing when you come down to that particular verse in verse 31, Jesus says it this way, Have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying? And it's throughout Matthew chapter 5 that we hear, Jesus using this phrase, but I say unto you. And Jesus is the one that says, I don't say anything lest I hear my father say it. I don't do anything or hear anything. I make no commands unless I receive that command from the father. So when Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he's getting this directly from our heavenly father. And we're to read this as though these words that come from Jesus come directly from our heavenly father as a picture of what he has done for us as represented by the attitudes, what he had, the attitudes, what he has done in us in the new birth by bringing us to faith in Jesus Christ and now at work within us by his Holy Spirit sanctifying us, this is the Father saying, I'm going to enable you to live in a manner that otherwise you could never live. So when you hear Jesus teaching, there's no superficiality with this. This isn't somebody wishing something. This is God saying, I am going to do this. And then he gets to the last verse of Matthew chapter uh, 5. I shouldn't say it that way. To this particular uh, section, he says in verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So everything that he's teaching here and what he's going to be teaching is all about these good works that grace is going to enable you and I to live that will be so wonderful and so amazing that people will look at this and know that these people live this way not because of who they, what they, because of them. It must be because they belong to Christ. Jesus said they'll glorify God. Now, we're out of time, but I, can, I just have to share one little story with you that will help you. Many, many years ago, my, my first wife, which now is deceased, got killed in a plane accident. We went through a divorce. It was a terrible divorce. And if anybody's been through a divorce, you know it is one of the most painful things you can go through. Because in a divorce, you're, you feel like somebody rejected you and threw you away. And I used to tell people... I felt like dog doo-doo in the middle of the street, and dogs came by and peed on it. That's how I felt. It was the most worst feeling. And I cried every day for three months, nonstop. So you're hurting, right? I say all that to say this. Only God could keep me from bitterness. Only God could keep me from acting any way that I acted. And I didn't even know how I was acting, folks. I honestly didn't know because I was so hurt. But I went to work one day, and I had a person walk up to me, and he said, Steve, why do you have so much peace? I've never seen anybody like you. I don't even talk to this guy. I might kind of wave to him. I don't, I don't know if I knew his first name. But he's seen something in me. Now, who gets the credit for that? The grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. I can remember walking away from that person, and I wondered, how did he notice that? So in other words, God is going to enable you to live a life that you're not even aware of. It's kind of like you're giving. You don't know what your left, your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing because it's so natural to you. It's just a part of you. City sitting on a hill. Right. You're a city sitting on a hill. City's not looking at itself. Everybody's looking at the city. 
And another time was, your brother came up to me. I'm, I told you the story. I'm there at my computer punching things in. Rick pulls up with his, his fork truck. He looks at me and says, what is it about you? Like, he caught me off guard, honestly. Even that other guy, I thought to myself, well, I should have maybe witnessed to him. I should have probably did this. I mean, I'm kind of caught off guard. I'm totally caught off guard. You know, I really believe there's people caught off guard about your life because there is grace working in your life right now. You are worshiping God each and every day. You're caught off guard. Rick says, what is it about you? I said, what are you talking about? I don't know. He says, you're so different. Well, how do you ever see Rick? What's the I talk to? What's, what's he see? You think about that. You think about that. And that's, what I, that's why I just feel in my heart I want to share these things with you. We're not going to be sharing rules and regulations. We're not going to be sharing with you uh, a message of legalism. We're going to be sharing with you, just like I just explained here, the grace of God in demonstration in the life of a Christian and able them to live a life that Jesus has explained, a life that's bigger than they could ever dream, greater than they could ever think about, totally beyond their natural ability and capabilities of living. But there's someone that's going to enable it. The Bible says, God, who is at work within you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. I think God is big enough to enable his disciples to live out the kind of life he's called us to live. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but see, for me, it's just like, oh, Lord, that is so great. I'm going to be able, by your goodness and grace, live out a life that you're going to show me. I, I can live this life out because of you. You're going to enable this in my life. This can be a reality in my life. This can be something that can be such a reality that I'm unaware of it, but others are aware of it. It doesn't say when Christians walk up to you and they see your good works in heaven. They, they see the good works of your Father and glorify your good works and glorify God in heaven. It's not going to be Christians. It's going to be other people noticing it. In other words, God is going to make you look so different to people. And we all look alike. We all seem alike to each other. We're around each other all the time. But when you're around other people, see, they see something different. Oh, Heavenly Father, we lift up our hands to you. We're grateful. We're thankful. We're so grateful. We're so thankful, Lord, that we're yours. We're yours. We're yours. We're yours. All these great truths, Lord, only you can make them a reality for your namesake and for your glory and for your honor. Lord, make it. Do it for your namesake. Do it for all the people that we live near. Lord, let it be so natural, so natural that it's like our left hand, our right hand doesn't know what that left hand is doing because it's just, ha it's working in our life. Lord, it's like Rick told me one time, me and Jill were coming home from church one night and we turned to each other and said, we hadn't had a beer in a long time. Lord, they didn't even know it <laughs> because you're so mightily at work in their life. Lord, continue this great work, this wonderful work that you're doing in our life. Lord, it's beautiful. It's a life of worship. It's a life of adoration. It's a life of glorifying God and magnifying Him. It's the greatest kind of life there is, Lord. And it's all made possible by you. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. We thank you, Lord, for enabling it each and every day. Carry us this week, Lord. Carry us each and every day. And all the things that we're going to face, carry us, enable us, and strengthen us. And by your Spirit, bring glory and honor to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Each and